Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I Know Them podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have H. Claire Taylor. Yes, it's a re air of a podcast that we did with her. And it's it was so good that I just thought we should do it again because Claire talks a lot about knowing you, what your motivation to write is and mm-hmm. understanding that. Um, writing characters using the Enneagram. Yes. Um, it's a great yes. episode. Yes. And she's very smart and really takes these things like the Enneagram and helps mm-hmm. writers apply it to their writing. Yeah. And uh, yeah. she's actually doing a Kickstarter right now. Yes. She's doing a, it, right now it's in the, the preview stage where you mm-hmm. can go and sign up to be notified. And it's her, her Kickstarter is all about the Enneagram. So if you're interested mm-hmm. in that and using that for writing, mm-hmm. we'll put a link in the show notes. And, yeah. And she has some really great, perks per level um she's doing some co- she's offering some coaching she's offering a retreat uh for just a few people so it's a really um exciting kickstarter so yeah we'll have that for you yeah uh, so i'm excited to see how it goes so many people are doing kickstarters now yeah and- yeah yeah so I've been working on mine this week. I was working on the interior formatting and I thought of a way to make it even more special. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So what I'm going to do is I went in vellum, did all in vellum. And I took, um, since it uh, takes place in the 1920s, I went to deposit photos and found like a, just an image of like a pattern that's kind mm-hmm. of art deco It's all curvy. And I put, I'm putting that on each facing page before each chapter. So like mm-hmm. when you open it up, it'll, you'll see this pretty pattern mm-hmm. and then the chapter. So mm-hmm. I'm doing that like at the beginning throughout yeah. the chapters and it just makes it look really cool. So I've ordered yeah. a print copy and we'll see how it turns out. Right. You, I just don't know how that's going to go. Right. But, um, so that was not hard to do. Um, I did have some issues with vellum saving and I think it's just, I'm saving it in a Dropbox. I think something with the sink just got messed up. Right. And so I went back in to look at it later and it's all gone. All my, oh. like the, all the changes I made yeah. are gone, which is not that hard to fix. And I think it's just. Well, you know, they had that random. new version come out. Yeah. But I think it's because I was saving it to Dropbox and I think it, it didn't know where to put it. It was ah. like, oh, this place. And if you take it out and I'm like, I'm putting it in Dropbox. So anyway, right. once I get that little glitch out, I'm sure it'll be fine. Right. And um, I've emailed Brad and he's, they're checking on it for me. To they're see on it. Think yeah. I did <laughs> it's a thing that's just a gremlin, right, which is right, right. probably user error. You know, yeah. it usually yep. is. Yep. Me so, too. Me too. Yeah. So what's oh. been going on with you this week? Well, so I've been working on that stuff. Um, and then um, if it works out, I am going to go to London for the self-publishing show live. Oh, wow. Yeah. So and I leave just in a couple of days. It's one of those things that I didn't think it was going to happen, but I think it's going to come together. I've got airline tickets. I'm only going to make it like for the second day of the show, not the first day. I'm going to stay and do some stuff in London. So I've been getting ready for that. And um, of course, I'm going to go see some stately homes while I'm there. Right. And I'm also going to go to the British Library. And I've, this is just makes my little nerdy heart so happy. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've requested a reader card so that I can go in and request materials. And I've requested, I searched the catalog and I found some stuff like from the twenties that I'm going to request and, you know, just go, I'm going to spend a day there probably just oh doing my it. And we go to a show or something. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So, how fun. Yeah, I mean, so. I'm not sure that I would spend my day in the library, but, I, but you know, I, I would be surprised it. if you did. <laughs> I get it. I get it. <laughs> But I'm definitely going to do other things as well. That's but anyway, fun. That's, so fun. that's well. That's, that's tell like, all our friends there. I said hi. I will, and mm-hmm. I'm sure it'll be a good conference. And I do feel like, like this is almost coming full circle because, like, mm-hmm. when we started the podcast, mm-hmm. I tried to go to SPF, yeah, in 2019, and we the world started shutting down, and my husband and I just decided to come home because we yeah. didn't want to get trapped over in the UK, right? As nice as it is there. So this is kind of if it actually works out, and I get to go. I'll feel like. Like yeah. we kind of made this the full circle and yeah. we can travel again, hopefully. Right, right. <laughs> so well, you know, I think we can travel now. So there you go. Well, you've been to Italy. So I know. <laughs> I know. Mm. 
I miss so it. what have you been doing this week? Oh, well, I am still teaching swimming lessons <laughs> at my daughter's house. I've pretty much moved out of my home and I moved into my daughter's house uh, in Dallas. It's not a separation from my husband. It's just, this is where I'm <laughs> Oh my gosh, bless his heart. And um, then I have been having some heavy thoughts about writing and stuff. I don't even know if I could put it into words. And um, and then my sister has had a very bad week. So that's oh. not helped anything um, yeah. with the ER twice with her. And uh, actually, oh. ironically, she's better. But mm-hmm. she, she is in just an enormous amount of pain, like to the point where she can't sit or stand and, um, mm-hmm. you know, things are going black around the edges oh, and no. stuff. And but her scans look better. So, you know, it's just hard. It's hard. Oh, yeah. If you've dealt with this, you know, it's hard. I don't mean to be a downer or a drag, but, you know, this is real life stuff. Mm-hmm. And, um. My my deep thoughts about writing are not uh, are kind of in relation to that. Like, how mm-hmm. do you balance that? Because mm-hmm. if it's not this, it could be something else. I mean, my parents are older. Our, mm-hmm. A lot yeah. of us, our parents are older, and you know, so um, yeah, just just trying to figure stuff out. I wish I could tell you that I had it all figured out, but it, that would be a lie. And I try really hard not to lie. Uh, so I don't have it figured out, but it's been, you know, all in all, it's been a good week. I'm here with the grandkids. So, you know, it's always nuts and fun. And my youngest is really, um, we're bonding. I guess you could say the youngest and I, so he still has not said my name. Like he says, everyone, he says strangers names and he doesn't say my name. I think he does it on purpose. I'm trying not to take it offense, but um, it's been hard. Keep his attention on you. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But anyway, that's what yeah. I've been up to, but nothing yeah. much. Um, just, you know, kind of riding out this time yeah. in our life that is not yeah. great. And, and sometimes that's what you just have to do. You just have to yeah. write it out and get through it. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. And I mean, mine I, is going to be the comeback story of the century when it happens. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still here and I still want to help you guys succeed. And uh, uh, speaking of that and the uh, Inkers Con. Mm-hmm. that we did last time that promo that we offered last week uh the affiliate the discount code, code yeah. yeah the discount code um is good until july 30th i think and i think so, so yeah. um you can still use it it's jamie capital j-a-m-i 22 mm-hmm. and uh you can get 50 off 50 dollars off the digital conference so yeah. that'll help i'm also still doing um uh, consulting. So if mm-hmm. anybody's interested, you can let me know and just DM me, slide yeah. into my DMs. That's and right. uh, yeah, that's what's going on here. Yeah. So we should probably get on to Claire's episode because yes. it was really great. Yes. Okay. So here's Claire. Today we have H. Claire Taylor with us. Hi, Claire. Hi. Thanks for having me. Oh, we're so glad you're here. <laughs> so let me read your bio and then we'll jump into the questions. Claire Taylor is a multi-genre author and a story consultant. She writes humor as H. Claire Taylor, paranormal police procedurals as Brock Bloodworth, and paranormal cozy mystery as Nova Nelson. She spent the last decade publishing over 30 novels, professionally editing, editing hundreds of manuscripts, teaching and tutoring English at the middle school and high school level, and now she helps some of the coolest indie authors through her online course and story alignment service. That's Awesome. And she's also the co-host of the Somewhere Book Show with Brian Cohen and owns FFS Media, which stands for exactly what you think it would stand for. <laughs> People ask me that all the time. Yeah. No, what does I it stand it for? Day. I saw like, that the other day in a comment. It was so funny. So, so t- tell us what, I mean, Sarah just went over the genres that you write in, but tell us a little bit about your writing and how you got into it and your books. Um, Well, I've been writing for a really long time, so I am unfortunately one of those people who kind of knew what I wanted to do. Yeah. Didn't have to, like, find myself. I mean, I found myself in other ways, I guess, but um, 
Yeah. So I've been writing since I was a really little kid. It's just sort of, um, I guess, control need. I really like being able to control a world. And oh, cool. I don't want to be like a like a full blown megalomaniac. So yeah, I became a writer. A good way to um, channel that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, but I, you know, I, I kept writing this stuff, and it was really fun at first, right? Mm-hmm. I got that first fun excitement of starting a new project, right. and then I was like, I should probably finish something. But I kept getting bored, and it wasn't until I started writing comedy that I thought, oh, this keeps my interest. This is fun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, because the whole thing about comedy is you, you go in one direction, then you change direction suddenly. And that's funny. Yeah. And yeah. so it was that change of directions, that sort of unexpected moment. Like when I got bored, I was like, well, then someone else, you, whoever would read this would get bored. Mm-hmm. So I'll throw something in there. That's funny to me. Right. And that was how I kept my attention. And that's ultimately how I started writing humor. That's great. That's great. And so you have your Jessica Kai series, your rock, um, oh, hang on. Bloodworth. Bloodworth. I always forget his last name. Brock Bloodworth series. Yes. And then your Nova Nelson um, or your paranormal cozy Nova Nelson series. And so, but you incorporate humor in all that, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's, it's the different, there are different kinds of humor. In yes. it. Yeah. Um, the Jessica Christ series is more satire mm-hmm. and commentary, uh, social commentary. And then, Brock Bloodworth, the Killhaven Police series is very dark humor. Yeah. Uh, by necessity, right? Yeah. It's it's werewolves and police officers and werewolf yeah. police officers and, yeah. and all that. So um that is a different kind of humor. And then it's much, I don't know, lighter humor in the Nova Nelson series, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. Eastwind Witches. A mm-hmm. lot of the humor comes from the dog, the well, yeah. it's a hellhound familiar yeah. that she has and you got to love dog humor. Yes, so. you do. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. Nothing better than dog humor. <laughs> yeah. So that one's a little fun. And, you know, we all have different senses of humor in different moments. And so right. it's, I like having all those different outlets for it. Right. Right. That's, That's great. great. Well, what was your first big success? Um, I would say the Jessica Christ series was my first mm-hmm. big one. I was putting all my effort towards that and I was starting to see it pay off. I think book four put out book four and I was like, Oh, I'm making a living off of this. This is crazy. Everyone said you couldn't do that with satire. Mm -hmm. Um, and so obviously I got a little success. So I decided to self-sabotage and start a new pen name (laughs) and uh, as one does, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What better time? Yes, exactly. Than when you're seeing a, a breakthrough success. Um, and so then I think my second, like that kind of, because I had so much time bet- between releases and starting new things, that one kind of took a dip. And then um, the East One Witches series with Nova Nelson was that, that's still, I haven't published a book in that since January and it's still my main seller. So yeah. Yeah. People love those, ser- those books. Um, you have There's- some rabid fans for sure. in that uh, <laughs> series. <laughs> they're, they're wonderful. They are. They're great. Mm-hmm. So what do you wish you'd known about writing and craft? Um, I wish I had known a little bit, and this is going to sound crazy because I studied like creative writing and literature in college, but I wish I had really understood what a story was, Mm. (laughs) you know, I mean, they're like, oh, it's a beginning and middle and end. And I had this professor who he, he was just the quintessential professor that we all had kind of our like daddy issues for (laughs) because he just with withheld so much affection. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but he would come in with his can of Diet Coke every day and he'd lean back in his chair and kick up his heels on his desk and, and say, you got to pin down the four corners of your story. He'd say that over and over. You got to pin down the four corners of your story. I wish I had any idea what he was talking about because it sounded <laughs> really good. I was like, yeah, I would love to pin down the four corners of my story. I have no idea what you're talking about. And I think what he was getting at was knowing what a story is about. Yeah. Know what you're, the story is about. And I think that's such a core of it that I missed for so long. I think we know it instinctually, right? Like we feel it when a story has something that it's clearly about. Right. And we, we know something's missing when it's just all external stuff happening. Right. Um, so that took me a while of writing before I was like, oh yeah, maybe I should figure out what this story is about (laughs) Mm -hmm. and that would help me steer the ship a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So I definitely um, wasted a lot of time on revisions and having to, you know, readjust a series and completely 
turn it in a different direction to kind of course correct because I was like, oh, I didn't know what it was about. So I was going towards something else, but now I know what it's about and I need to, you know, bring it back around and that takes time and it, it loses readers along the way. And so I think that was the main thing, just really getting down to the core of what a story is, why people love stories Mm -hmm. and how to create one that resonates with the kind of people you're looking for. Right. I think, I think, I think that is 100% right. And I think that is where, why it takes me so long to write a book because it takes me a while to figure out what a story is about. But in my last book, the theme, you and I talked about the theme, and, and I will tell you, this could turn into a whole fangirl thing between Sarah and I because we both use Claire <laughs> in her story alignment and she's helped both of us so much. But, um, but knowing that theme even though it took me a long time to write the story, it wasn't because I didn't know what I was writing. And w- and then when you get reviews that say exactly what it is you were trying to convey, that's so gratifying. It, it just really makes a huge, huge difference. Um, and so I, I think you're right. That's where I'm stuck now with this story. I don't really know what it's about yet. We'll, so. we'll talk. We'll talk. We can talk. Yeah. Off, off air. <laughs> no need to bore the listeners. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I was going to say too that there's a big difference between the like learning how a story is put together theoretically mm-hmm. and then doing it yourself. So like, and I think a lot of times you'd only learn it when you start doing it, you know, like that putting it into practice because you can know, oh, this is a way to structure a story and these are the different parts. But until you actually do it yourself, for me, that was how I learned how to do it was just like on the job training, you know. Definitely. Yeah. You have to do it a lot. I mean, um, you know, I have a few books out, but I have a lot more books that I've never published that I won't ever publish probably. Um, so it's one of those things that it's like, yeah, there's a lot of work that goes into it that, that will never see the light of day, mm-hmm. Yeah, which is why you have to love it because yeah. you have to love the process. Yeah. yeah. You have to love the process. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, what about marketing? What do you wish you had known about marketing? Oh boy. Well, I wish I had known what I wanted out of writing a little bit more Mm -hmm. so that I could build a marketing plan and expectations for that marketing plan um, that matched what would actually fulfill me. So, you know, it started out, I I was publishing, I had a couple standalones because I thought that's what you did um, because, you know, I was modeling off of traditional publishing Mm -hmm. And um, I was coming out of academia and that's very much like, well, you need to write literary fiction and it needs to be a standalone and it can't make anyone happy. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. No no laughter laughter at all. Oh my gosh. I turned in a satire to one of my professors for like my senior, you know, thesis thing. Mm -hmm. And they were like, what, what is this? I was like, I don't know. A little bit of joy. Sorry. Um, (laughs) But yeah. So I had to kind of get over that myself because yeah. I had the wrong idea of what writing should be for me and what mm-hmm. uh, my goals should be rather than what I actually wanted them to be. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's hard to know how to market if you don't know what you want out of it. Right. Right. And yeah. so like, then I went in and I started this indie publishing thing. I was like, Oh, a series. Okay. I'll do a series. Um, and I started writing Jessica Christ series And I was like, I want, you know, money for it. But I also know that it's not going to make as much money as I, you know, as someone who's writing to market in a very hot genre is going to make. And so I didn't really know what I wanted. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know how to market it. So I think that first crucial step of like, once I realized I want to, you know, my goal is to make enough money doing this to pay some bills Mm -hmm. and to afford to keep doing this because it's so fun and Mm -hmm. there's honestly nothing else I'm qualified for. So (laughs) I'm stuck. Yeah. After you do this job for a while, you just can't really go back to. Yeah. You're ruined. Doing anything. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Well, and also like, I don't have any qualifications either. Yeah. (laughs) Really. I, I got rid of that safety net by accident. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no plan B and I would have to go back to school for something. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. "Mm, I can't do that again. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's my goal. So once I know that, then my marketing plan is, okay, well, I just need to find the readers for this. Right. And 
I just need to find X number of readers to, to meet this goal because I'm not shooting for unlimited money here. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think you find happiness with trying to, with your goal being, I'm going to make as much as possible. I think you find happiness by saying, okay, maybe I need like 5,000 a month right. or, or 2,000 a month, depending right. on your expenses and all that. And then you just figure out how to do that. Right. right. And then once you make it, you're like, great, I hit a goal. I can, I can go watch Netflix, you know? Right. <laughs> Exactly. And I think that that mentality is pretty foreign right now in a lot of indie publishing circles. You know, it's the more, more, more. And you actually helped me see that. I I was having those same sort of feelings, but I couldn't put them into words. And you and I were talking about it. And that is exactly right. There's no reason. I mean, more money is great, I guess, if, if it, as long as it doesn't come at the cost of your health and your well-being and your ment, you know, your soul. Um, but there's no, you know, there's no reason to shoot for the stars if shooting a little bit lower still meets your needs and you're still happy and you still get to do the things you want to do. So I think that's really, I, yeah, I just think that's important. There is sort of this idea of like, if you're not willing to sacrifice yeah. everything, you're not yeah. really in this. And it's like, but no, there's a lot of things I don't want to sacrifice that I see some people sacrificing and I'm like, that's good for you. I don't choose to give up that. Right. Yeah. Right. And so and- I'm going to adjust my expectations accordingly. I'm not going to pretend that if I make, you know, s- seven figures this year, I'll suddenly be happy. Mm-hmm. And then I'll, I'll have reached that finish line of happiness. And then suddenly right. I'm like, yay, I'm happy. I would prefer to be happy the whole way there. Yeah. there. Absolutely. Yeah. It's Absolutely. like we've gone from one extreme to the other. You know, used to you were, you had to be the starving artist to be, you know, do you know, that was what you were. And now it's like if you're not the multimillionaire <laughs> indie, indie author, you're not doing well. And it's like we have to each like you're saying each figure out what works for us and then be happy with that right. and just keep going on our own track. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that you just don't need that much money. <laughs> you know, you don't, you just don't need that much money, period. But also it's like, I know plenty of Indies who are, are making a decent living. Like I'm making a living, y'all are making a living, you know, and it's, you don't have to be a superstar. In fact, yeah. the superstar stuff is probably unwanted once you get there. Right. Yeah. Right. We're feeding an ego need that can't ever be. You yeah. Know, it's a, it, that's a bottomless hole. Yeah. I know. I just think that because like you write your Nova Nelson books pretty fast yeah. because that, I mean, that's just not because you're killing yourself, but those books just come to you. Pretty, I mean, you know, they're not, I don't want to say easy to write, but they're in kind of your wheelhouse and you can write those pretty mm-hmm. fast, but you don't, I don't think you sacrifice stuff to do that. I mean, you know, it, to put those out that fast. And I, I, would say that I, I did for a while. You did. So when I started that pen name, I was convinced that I was going to do the book a month thing. And um, I, a couple of times I went from start of an idea to, pu- to published in like three weeks. Oh, and that wow. was not fun. No. Um, that was, that was created by a sense of urgency that I think was a little bit excitement. Cause you know, I have that, like, I love starting things. Oh, I love do. starting things that I, <laughs> I will never finish. Um, so it had that excitement energy. It also had sort of the urgency of I'm leaving my other series right. to do this. So I need to get right. it done fast, right. which right. was not a good strategy um, because it, it was straddling strategy. So right. it was right. not going to work. Um, and then I realized like, I don't, I don't really need to set this precedent with my readers that they get a book a month. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't really want to train them for that. And I kind of did. And so I had to kind of untrain them mm-hmm. <laughs> and um yeah, so I I tried the sacrificing everything. I bought into that yeah. for a little bit. Yeah, be- and it do. was making me really good money. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, "But I don't, I don't need this much money, <laughs> <laughs> I, and I need some more sleep. I need some more sleep. I need some happiness. I need right. less headaches. Yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. So, what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career? And looking back, did they turn out to be right or wrong? Um, my assumptions were that there are like three people who make a living off of writing and the uh-huh. rest of, you know, us just toil yes. and that was wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I kind of started this, I think it was like maybe 2012 that I published my first book, which I'd been writing for like seven years. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, at that time 
I didn't know anything about indies. It mm-hmm. wasn't until I think 2014 or 2015 that I started to really understand that there's a whole community of people who were doing this. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that was my assumption that it was um, only a select few do it, but I was just stubborn enough to say, well, then I guess I'll be one of them. Right. You know, <laughs> I guess I'll make myself be yeah. one of those, you know, <laughs> handful of people who can make a living off of it. Right. Um, there's, not enough can be said for wanting to prove people wrong. Right. I agree with that. And I'm so glad that I didn't have to do it that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this is another one of our favorite questions we like to ask. Um, have you ever made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing? Constantly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't remember what I put for this um, or what I was thinking for this, but um, yes, let's see. I... I learn from all of my mistakes. Mm -hmm. I I learn and then some like, well, I have to punish myself first, right? I have to, I have to beat myself up and punish myself a little bit. And then I'm like, no, there's probably, there's probably something in that. Excuse me. And uh, yeah, I would say taking, man, you know, I kind of see all the things that I would at the time thought as mistakes were like, well, that was necessary for me. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have done it any differently. Right. So, you know, starting a new pen name, sometimes I look at that and I'm like, that was a mistake to run screaming from the success of Jessica Christ. But at the same time, I needed to do that in that moment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can't just do one, one pen name. I can't just do one series. That's too intense for me. And I, since I'm a little bit of a perfectionist, if I, I start to put too much pressure on myself when I just, it's all writing on one thing. Right. And then it's like, oh, you've got to get this next book. And then I'm trying to, you know, force through this wall when really I need to like take a break and then realize that, oh, I could just walk around this wall. You know, right. like it's right. so that that juggling between series, I don't know that I could have done it any differently just mm-hmm. based on my personality and what I need. Right. But it felt like a mistake at the time. Yeah. yeah. Very good. And then what what about the opposite? Something you thought this is a home run and it turned out to be not a home run. Oh my God. I feel like this is my constantly answer. <laughs> um, uh, uh, gosh, everything. Yeah, I always, no. I always have too high of expectations for how good things are going to be, despite the fact that most people call me cynical. Um, I, you know, I really thought, I thought that the Nova Nelson penny would take off a lot more than it did. Uh-huh. It took off. It took off. Right. Yeah. And if I had been an objective observer, I'd have been like, dang, that was good. Like, mm-hmm. good job you. But I was like, no, I, I need to make, you know, three times there are people making four times as much as me. It's always when I compare myself yep. to other people, because there's no comparison. There's everyone's got different things going on. Everyone's got different, um, you know, circumstances and things that they won't sacrifice. Right. Yeah. You know? And it's like, oh yeah, I'm not going to spend five hours a day writing 10,000 words every day. Mm-hmm. No. Ooh. Why would I want to do the, you know, why would I want to drive myself to hate my job? Right. So yeah, I think, it, I think a lot of it, my expectations have always been high and I get a little disappointed mm-hmm. when I compare it to p- other people. I know that's not a very specific answer, but it no, just, but I think that's exactly right. That's, yeah, that's very, very yeah. true. Very common. Yeah. I, think I think a lot of people can relate to that. Myself. Yeah. Yeah. For one. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So we wanted to talk to you about um, working with authors because you work with a lot of authors. So um, you help them plan their books. You help them kind of strategize their stories and their series. So what are the most common mistakes you see people making? I see there's, there's a few, but one of them is that people will write stories that they're not interested in. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's the fastest way to not finish a book or they'll pick a trope that they think has to be in that genre and then, but they don't really like it. Mm -hmm. And, and that creates a sort of like mental knot, um, that they, that is hard to get past. And so a lot of it is just, you know, sometimes you just need someone to go, why do you, why do you have that? You don't like that. Don't write that. And I've done that too. I I've written myself tropes 
um, mm-hmm. that I hated or like characters that are like, well, I need to write this character in and I write it. And then, I mean, one of them, I just, I literally dropped a large object on because I was so sick of writing him. I was like, <laughs> you know what? We're just going to drop a typewriter, like a giant typewriter yeah. on him. We're going to get him out of here. I, was, I mean, this is, literally God did it in the book. Yeah. So, um, I was like, yeah, hand of God to that. Cause I don't want to write that trope anymore. So immediately I was like, oh, this is so much better. This is so much more fun. (laughs) So that's one common thing is people feel the need to write things because they've seen them in other books and they don't love them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's just a preference. Like tropes are so personal, what you do and don't like. Mm -hmm. And the way they're presented can also be personal. And I mean, it's, so just write to your taste and Mm -hmm. then. Again, a lot of people don't know what their story is about going into it, Mm -hmm. which is hard to know what your story is going to be going into it because you can guess Mm -hmm. and you can say, I'm going to write this story about this. And then you go, Ooh, this story is about something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do that. It Mm -hmm. happens, you know, but it's about asking the question and continuing to keep an eye on it. Uh Um, I'm a story I'm working on right now for a new pen name. First of all, book ones take a long time to do mm-hmm. yeah. because you have to get to know a lot about this story. And it's that, that terrible, um, you know, sort of catch 22 of like book one has to be the best one because it's yes. what you need to catch people with. But it's also the one that you're necessarily going to be the least, you know, into because you don't know what's happening yet. Right. Um, so like, it's going to have the, the, the least amount of development generally, or you're not really going to understand it. So spending a lot of time on book one is normal. That's another thing. People want to rush through book one, but it's like, no, nail that one. Mm -hmm. I've gone back in series and rewritten book one. And that is so gross. Like to mm-hmm. have, yeah. have not done that to go back and edit yeah. b- a first book in your series. It's like, oh, I don't care about this anymore. But you right. want to get that conversion. You yeah. need to fix mm-hmm. things because you've discovered things later on. So I think um, helping people with that discovery early and up front um, can mm-hmm. be good. And if you need to revise it later, you can, um, you yeah. know, before you publish it, before you've moved on mentally from it. Yeah. Um, another thing that people do that's common is they confuse their character's motivation with their own. Mm. And that gets confusing because you don't know how to, you you know, it's, it's something you have to be really cognizant of because you can say, well, I'm motivated by, um, a fear of abandonment, but is my character motivated by this fear of abandonment Mm -hmm. or do they not care about that? Are they, you know, are they motivated by a fear of being controlled? Because that's going to be kind of a different impulse. And so they're going to behave differently in different situations. Mm So once that gets muddled, like the readers won't know how to articulate that, but they'll know something's off or like they would never do that. You don't want your readers to ever go, that character would never do that. Right. So you really got to know why they do what they do. Right. Right. That's right. And then you also, um, so you help authors plan stories and stuff, but you also help authors just with their indie lives, you have a free course on that. Tell us about that. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what we've been talking about yeah. is just, it's not, there's not one way, to, you know, one path to happiness. And I mm-hmm. see a lot of discussion about money in the community. Mm-hmm. And I think it's great that this is a place where people can make a lot of money. Right. Um, and maybe I'm like a little old school, but I think it's kind of gauche to like discuss too much about money. Yes. Openly and I've been guilty of it so many we times. We all have because it yeah. feels good. Yeah. It feels good to do that, to be like, well, look at all this money I made. Um, <laughs> right. Like that's so what the yeah. is. Yeah, so long it was kept so secret, you know, it's yeah. like nobody knew what anybody was making, especially in traditional publishing. So you didn't really know you were like, am I doing well? Am I not? And now that people right. are talking about it, you kind of have a way to go, Oh, you can measure yourself by other people, even though that's probably not the best for our yes. own, you know, self identity and worth, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And because it's such an open, I think it's great that people like don't feel confined to not mm-hmm. talk about it or, you know, talk about it in hushed whispers, but then it becomes the focus right? and we don't move past that. So authors don't know what that money is supposed to make them feel and what they're actually chasing when they want money. So what, right. what are we talking about when we talk about money and what are we talking about when we talk about art? Those are two things that you have to figure out and make sure that they're compatible because mm-hmm. that, that conflict will create resistance in you. For, and keep you from moving forward and expend extra energy. 
Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, it's like if you're, if you're drinking through a straw and there's holes in the straw, you're just not going to get as much, you know, it's just going to be not working. Um, so the, the, something I do with authors is try and help people understand their own motivations. Um, like for me, why do I want money? You know, why? So I want money because it makes like, once I get my own basic needs met, Mm -hmm. I like to have that money to do good things with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that makes, because my need is to feel good, like a good person. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's not everyone's need. And that took me a very long time to figure out because I was like, why aren't you doing the right thing? Yeah. <laughs> What's, <laughs> what is wrong with you? What broke in your brain? But it's just like, that's, that's not the top priority for people. Right. Um, for everyone. And that's fine. And, you know, some people, they, the money brings them security. Some people, uh, they like the money because then they can travel because the thing that they really want is freedom mm-hmm. and the ability to, you know, feel free. And so, that's kind of what I do. It's like, okay, once we figure out what you want your money to do for you, you can figure out how much you actually need. Right. And then you can look at your, you know, creative values, why you actually write. And you can align those two things mm-hmm. so that you are writing with a sense of purpose mm-hmm. and not feeling um, like you're going without. Because if that if that core need isn't met, you do crazy things. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You do crazy things. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, you know, if yeah, what you yeah. want is connection, but you don't really acknowledge that, you know, you, you may like, you know, know, in college, it's like people want to connect, but they don't know how to do it. So they maybe sleep around or something, right? Like you're chasing the wrong thing. You want connection, but you, you're going for this like superficial version of it. That's actually um, depriving you even more of Mm -hmm. what you need. Mm -hmm. So that's the cycle that a lot of people get caught in um, with not just money, but art. And so I like to help people out of that so that they can be happy, functioning people. That's great. That's great. Yeah. So then back to story. Let's go back to the story because I wanted to get that in there, though, about your indie author alignment um, course because it's so good. And, and I posted it. I just posted it when it first went up. I can't tell you the number of people who have uh, DM me to say to thank me for, for putting that up. Well, I have to thank you for posting about it because <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, how many people are signing up right now? <laughs> That's going to be my new, my new like marketing technique is this is what Jamie does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, and these were not new authors. These, some of these authors are doing very well, have been doing this for a long time. And they just were like, I had not thought of those things. And so I, I just think it's we're not great. taught to. There's yeah. at yeah. no point in our formal education are we ever asked to think about these things. Yeah. No. And at no point does society prioritize this mm. kind of thinking. So yeah. Yeah. it's it's easy to miss. Yeah. Yeah. It is. And when it I is. saw it, I wanted to be like, why is no one talking about <laughs> this? You know, just so angry at, at the universe. Yeah, exactly. So wh- what about when you're plotting a book? Let's go back to story and writing, but what should you think about when you're plotting a book, when a, when an author is plotting a book? I tend to think about uh, myself. I like to think about tension and power mm-hmm. and um, I take a lot of the tips from humor and apply that to other things mm-hmm. because it's just knowing uh, you you have to know what's expected mm-hmm. and then you subvert it. Right. And that's, that's what a joke is. <laughs> <laughs> if we're really going to make it as boring as possible, mm-hmm. it's knowing what the expectation is and then undermining it somehow. Right. Because that creates in your brain, these three stages where you have to, you know, you recognize that something's wrong, you try and fix it. And then when you resolve it, that's this hit of dopamine, this relief that you get. Mm -hmm. And it's through that relief that you laugh. It's the Mm -hmm. tension and the release that makes Mm -hmm. you laugh. So you can do that with, um, with mystery. Mm -hmm. You can do that with, um, really with anything. Cause it's just about tension. Mm -hmm. You, you pose something, uh, you pose a, a question at the start and then you answer it and that's your story. Yeah. Uh, but once you answer it, your story's over. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's, that's kind of it. So um, when I'm working with authors, it's, it don't work a whole lot on plotting because there's so many different ways to do it. Mm-hmm. And I, honestly, as long as like, we kind of, we do kind of recognize a natural sort of um, 
pattern of story. Like we, we've all Mm -hmm. absorbed stories throughout our whole lives. Right. So, um, you know, that things have to change, you know, that it has to build. Most people already know about three act structure or something similar. Some people do four acts. Some people do five acts. I've seen someone try and do seven acts. I was like, all right, whatever. Um, I don't understand any of this, but if it's working for you, fine. Really, it's just about developing. So you need you need your theme and you need your protagonist and your protagonist mm-hmm. needs to change mm-hmm. somehow mm-hmm. or uh, they need to change and they don't change at the end and then you have a tragedy. Yeah. So that's really what a story is for me. So that's how I look at it. And if you want to, you know, name it different things, I mean, I'll talk about the inciting incident mm-hmm. and I'll talk about, you know, the, the midpoint you know, turn or whatever, fun and games. We'll talk about all that stuff, whatever your vocabulary is. But um, it's really just about building and developing up to that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I remember we, um, because writing Homecoming King was very long, hard process for me because I've talked about this, but personal stuff and everything. And so I got to November and I was like, I, I, this is horrible. I can't, I don't know where to go. I'm saying, and Claire got on a message with me and said, as soon as Christmas is over, we'll get together. You come to me in Austin. Now she not, may not do this for everyone. <laughs> you come to me. For a price. I yeah. know. <laughs> and we spent the weekend and we went through my story, but I just remember one part we were talking about this one thing where they, um, there's a billboard and, if you haven't read it, spoiler alert, but um, there's a billboard and it's of her and pe- someone keeps defacing it. And we were t- laughing about how they could deface it. And then I said, Oh wait, she defaces it. And I just, Claire's face went, oh! I mean, it was like, I knew that I'd hit the nail on the head when I said it, it was just like, she went, Oh my gosh, that's perfect. And, and so, you, you know, when you get to a point like that, when you subvert what people actually expect, you just know you have something there. And um, I think that that's, and I don't think I would have thought of that had I not worked with Claire. I just, I just don't know that I would have. So, well, anyway. and that, that's what I love when I, I love when we do these story alignments is that it's usually not that much that needs to be, you know, like no, the parts are, thing. Yeah. are usually there. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's, and because as a storyteller, your subconscious is built for this and yes. you've, a lot of the times people have put the exact thing they need somewhere else (laughs) and they'll mention it like, Oh, and then I have this weird like thing, but I don't, I'm probably going to cut that. And I'm like, what? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you mean the missing piece that makes everything fit together? Yeah. Don't cut that. And then we bring it in, you know, because your subconscious has already made these connections and it's just about bringing it forward and weaving it together. And so I like to be sort of minimally invasive, like a good surgeon, you know, yeah. And just say like, okay, well, we already have like, we'll just take a graph from your thigh, right? <laughs> it's almost like therapy. I mean, it really is. you just sort of ask a question and then, you know, I don't know how Sarah's yeah. thing was, but that was how mine was. It was really. There is a lot so of like, like, tell me about your protagonist's yeah. mother. <laughs> That's always good to get into though, right? Because it it's oh. like the background and stuff. So speaking of that, so you love to use the Enneagram. And Mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting because I don't know of anybody else that's doing this. So talk to us about how you started using that and how you use that for um, plotting and character and how you, how you help authors use it in their stories. Right. So I, I do love the Enneagram and I, I've been into it for a while. I remember when I was like in high school, my mom and sister went and did some Enneagram class at their church And they came back and were like, you're a whatever. No, you're a whatever. They're telling me all these numbers. I was like, I don't love this. Um, (laughs) I don't love you guys. Stop diagnosing me. (laughs) You don't know me. Um, And so that was kind of my first first exposure. I think think they were all wrong. Like, I think they were both wrong about my number too, um, which just goes to show how much my family listens to me. Um, (laughs) That's very misunderstood. Um, So that was my first introduction. I read a little bit about it and then I started looking more into it. Um, I did a test. I mean, I actually, when I tested, because I think I tested when I was a teen and I got a different number. Um, And, but you're not, it's not super accurate when you're a teen, just FYI. Um, We're still figuring out, you know, 
um, what, what is up and what is down, but it was the number that I play in my family, Mm. in my family unit. It was actually that role that I tested Mm. as now that that I look back on it. It's one of my current wings, which I won't even get into wings, but, um, (laughs) so, so then I started using it for myself and looking at a lot of my own, um, issues that were arising, the same patterns that kept coming up. Um, the, like, I'll just do it myself pattern. That was a big one. Um, the critic, you know, criticism of other, of myself. Oh, I mean, big inner critic energy. And then I realized once I started working with the Enneagram, Oh, this is all, this is all type one energy. So the Enneagram has nine types. Um, it's the numbers one through nine. Each one has kind of a label, um, a profile of it and it can get very complex. But uh, I was the type one, the reformer. Some people call it the perfectionist, but I don't like that. So I'm going to change it. Um, <laughs> no, I like the reformer a little bit better because it's that ability to see what's wrong and fix it, which is what I have built my whole career on mm-hmm. without really knowing it. That's what satire is. It's you finding the wrong things and the things that are going wrong in society. And you just jab at them and nag at them in a hopefully comedic way, you know. Um, and then when I'm working with clients, it's like, oh. That's, I I immediately see like, okay, that's working. That's working. I don't care about what's working right now. (laughs) Like we're going to get to the thing that's not working. And so once I started to develop it, I realized that was actually a huge strength that I could use. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, working with other people, I found that it was really useful if I could kind of pinpoint their type. You're not supposed to like tell people their type, but you can figure it out. (laughs) Um, And then you start to realize what is actually driving them and what, what is going on behind the words that they're saying. And so it, it makes the world a much more livable place is what I found. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that was, that was, you know, years ago. And so then I started to realize, well, what if, what if you can use that for, for writing? Because Enneagram, you know, there, there's Myers-Briggs, there's the strengths finders, there's disc profile, there's all these profile um, personality profiles, but this one is special because it talks about motivation. That is ultimately what it's about. It's about core motivation is what defines your type, not whether or not you read a lot of books mm-hmm. or, you know, whether if you're, you're an introvert, introvert or extrovert. Yes. Yeah. It's not any of that. It's yeah. just what motivates you to do the things you do. And so there's this core fear and this core desire for each type. And we basically live our whole lives based on that um, until we start to recognize it and develop it. And so then there's this development path for each, this growth path for each type. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, that's what a story is. Yes. It's, it's going up and down this growth path for your specific type. That's, right. It's following a protagonist doing this. And so then I realized how useful it is um, for story because it, it, it may seem like, oh, I'm going to make a stock character. If I'm just yeah. going to make them a type six, the loyalist, then oh, oh, well, they're just, you know, it's not a 3D character, but it's actually a very 3D character. It's the most three-dimensional character you can do yeah. because now you're not, you know what motivates them and you're not afraid to move them in big ways. Because yeah. a lot of the times, if you don't know your character, you're kind of like, what do I do with them? Right. Right. How do I get them to do like, I need them to go to, you know, London. How do I get them to go to London? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's like, she can't fall in love with someone in London if she's not in London yet. How do I get her to go there? And I need to do it in a believable way. And so then, you know, um, she is trying to prove something to her parents or, you know, she's trying to um, escape a bad, you know, a deal gone bad or something. Right. So th- these words like escape or prove, um, they all go back to these different types motivations. So once you know that you can, you can, once you know their type, you know exactly what button to press and it's like the activate button or, you know, <laughs> how do I get them to run away? I send this their way, you know? So then yeah. you just become this like puppet master, but you can do that and you can make really dramatic stuff happen and it. It feels very believable. So that's how I got into using it. Um, and then, you know, if you're working with a protagonist type, you can also work with the author's type Mm -hmm. and you can work with the audience's type, like the ideal reader's type. And so now you can really align all these motivations in a way that makes things flow and makes it really easy and seamless for everybody. And that's what everyone's looking for anyway. Yes. That's amazing. You're very strategic in your thinking. That's what I've noticed is that like you can look at the big picture 
And I think a lot of us were so close to our work that it really helps to talk to somebody else who has, I mean, when we talked, you really had no idea about my story or anything because it was an idea for a new series, but you were able to go in and go, oh, well, what if you did this? And if you look at it this way, this is a new perspective. And that I think is something that we don't, you know, I'm more focused on, okay, I have to get book one written and then I need to, you know, have these plot lines and it's very narrow and you were able to like kind of help me see the bigger picture, which is really helpful, you know? Yeah. Well, it's the privilege of not being in it, right? <laughs> in sure. the trenches. <laughs> yeah. It's always, but, yeah. So but you, you know, like always... our husbands and our wives and our kids, they're not really interested in all this stuff. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they are not, no. So we need somebody who understands story and has this bigger view and can yeah. look at it and pinpoint things that are helpful. Yeah. Right. And I, I mean, that's just, it's the same thing that like Jamie said. It was like therapy. It's, you know, it is. it's yeah. not like your, your therapist is a magician or a mind reader. Yeah. It's just, they're there. And you know, it's like, I'm here, I'm here for an hour and we're going to go real hard on this hour and we're going to get this figured out. Um, you know, and if it, if it has to go over time to figure it out, we'll do that because now is the time that like you get to be honest about it. And we, like, I have, I'm just blown away by, by people's honesty in these calls and like people's vulnerability in these calls. And I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> like, this is great. This is so helpful. Yeah. Like, I'm not judging you. Let's get it all out there. Like, let's figure out like, what is your deepest, you know, fear? Yeah. What is like, and then, cause that's what you got to do. You got to be honest before you can really get this story, um, really identify what you want the story to do for you, the author. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing that's that's always fun. Yeah. One thing it helped me with it is like there, when you're writing, there's so many possibilities for a character, Mm -hmm. you know, there can be so many different ways. And like, if I can, like, this has helped me like narrow it down and go, okay, this is what her motivation is. And then I can work off that. And there's a lot of variations that you can take with each you know, number that Mm -hmm. like you were saying about the wings and stuff, that's beyond me. I don't understand all that, but you know, you do have just, it's not like you're, Oh, well this is, she's a number five or whatever. So therefore she is always going to behave this way. You've got variations that you can play on. And And you've got, you know, you've got basically their good behavior and their bad behavior. And like you said, I mean, once you know what, what motivates them, then you do know exactly what buttons to push. I mean, you know, if you know that they're motivated by whatever fame if they, or, or, you know, uh, being acknowledged or whatever, then, you know, having people ignore them will really put them in a really bad situation or having people not give them the proper credit that they feel like they deserve. Will put them, you know, I mean, and that's just, that just makes it easier just makes mm-hmm. it easier as I sit here, you know, grinding my teeth over my story. It makes it so much easier. <laughs> We're all grinding our teeth lately. Yeah, no. uh, well, you, right. And, and the important thing about uh, a character people relate to is that character's flaws. So you right. have mm-hmm. to know what flaws, because sometimes people will write these characters right. and they, they tend to be male characters yeah. who have no weaknesses <laughs> and are really just good at kind of everything except like, you know, maybe their weakness is that they won't embrace their feminine side. I don't yeah. know, like that they're yeah. all man. Oh, this guy's just too man. Yeah. Um, you know, or something like that. I'm just making, you know, this is obviously yeah. just a joke, but um, if you don't know what their flaw and you have to give them a flaw and you have to do it in a way that's not going to make people reject them. So you have to do it in the right context so that people understand it and people naturally understand, um, you know, this Enneagram type, these Mm -hmm. types, like it's, it's a very, we've all met every single type. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like if you know, you know, nine people, (laughs) um, you probably may, or you may all know all one time, you know, but you start to get the odds when you know a few hundred people. Um, so we recognize it. And if you don't know that you're like, well, what is, what is their flaw? What's really going to like, and sometimes people will give a flaw that's just inexcusable. Right. And then it's like, oh, this isn't a likable character at all. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to know how to balance it too. Right. And I think it helps when you like it helped. We did not talk about this, but, but it, we talked about story and stuff, but we didn't talk specifically about Enneagram when I was writing 
the bride series, but in book one, the hero for book two is in it. And he's not, I mean, he's a funny character, but he's not a particularly likable character. A lot of people didn't love him, but they were interested in him. So when I started writing that book, it was very hard because I was like, he's not, if I don't do something, he's not going to, if he doesn't save somebody's cat, he's (laughs) not going to be likable. But then it hit me that he, because he was very rich and kind of threw things around, but he grew up very poor, like very poor. And when that happened, that entire story just completely opened up. It was, it was the craziest thing. And, but that's exactly what you're talking about. Like, just finding that weakness or that flaw and then you just poke at it until, Mm -hmm. until they either acknowledge it or come to some kind of grips with it. Yeah. And like characters, when I say likable, they don't have to be nice. No, no. Lecter is a really a quote unquote likable character. You can love to hate a character, Um, but yeah, it needs something redeeming. And sometimes like the redemption can just be that they're intelligent. Yes. Mm -hmm. They can outsmart people. That's, I mean, with serial killer stuff, that's kind of it. Like you, yeah. they're charismatic and you're like, well, I don't like them, right? They murdered a lot of people, yeah. but I like to watch them. Yeah. So it's really, the likability uh, is really just some sort of appeal or yeah. intrigue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, and I think you're just so good at helping people see that and stuff. And you always hate it when I say this, but I, I have all, I, I've known Claire since the Smarter Artist Summit in 2006 and 16. And I always thought Claire was the smartest person in the room and the funniest. And so when she wanted to be my friend, it was like, I felt like I'd won the lottery. I'm not lying, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I know. I remember the first I heard you say something like, not to me, but complimentary about me to somebody else. And I went home and I just like, I thought <laughs> on that. I have problems. I have real problems. <laughs> but she is super smart and you really do just have such a unique way of looking at story and life. And I think that it's really beneficial to other authors to, uh, to, to take the time to look at things that way. So it's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. So tell us what's the best thing you think you've done to set yourself up for success in your author career? Learning what I want out of it. Yep. Yeah. Learning what I want and getting real about what I am not willing to sacrifice Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and where my strengths are. I mean, like you make, you, you, you know, are over there flattering me, but a lot of the things that you just described as qualities you like about me Uh are things that I grew up thinking were flaws Uh, and were faults. Um, you know, just making, I made too many jokes at, yeah. <laughs> at bad times or, you know, like people were annoyed cause I couldn't have fun cause I want to talk about stuff yeah. <laughs> or, you know, like <laughs> these things that they're not, both of those are not traditionally feminine qualities. Yeah. Right. And right. so there's kind of that thing you have to go through of like, converting your flaws into strengths. That's yeah. what mm-hmm. a good story, you know, a character yeah. in a good story does. And we have to kind of do that ourselves. And so I think that that personal work is the best thing you can do yeah. as an author, because when you're writing books, if you aren't, if you aren't willing to admit your, your flaws, mm-hmm. if you're not willing to really dive deep and assess some things and reassess things that you thought were true, mm-hmm. you're not going to come up with a fun, intriguing story. Yeah. So there's so much personal work that has to go into being an author to create genuine art. And I know we're getting a little like crazy artiste here, Um, (laughs) but like, like, have you, I mean, sometimes you meet people and you're like, you have so much, like you have no self-awareness. How do you write? You know? And so I think that like (laughs) some of that, some of that personal work and learning what you want out of it and what you can do and what you, you know, like, why would you try and write something that's not in your wheelhouse? Right. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Critical. Yeah. Critical to understand. So where can people find out more about your books and about your courses? So that is all at ffs.media. That is my website. All the courses are there. You can also follow me on Facebook. Uh, I have started doing some little YouTube videos. I'm going to put more up each 
month, week, (laughs) I don't know. Time is a flat circle. Um, and you know, just little things to kind of get you going and get you thinking about it. Cause these are all these, like, I don't have answers. I just have like really obnoxious questions. You have deep questions. I have deep deep questions questions. (laughs) that I want people to start thinking about. I know that if people start asking those questions, they are you know, brilliant human beings who can come up with some great answers that I wouldn't have come up with. Yeah. So that's what I try and do in a lot of my videos. Um, you can also join my email list, but yeah, it's all at ffs.media. You can find it there. You log on, it says, are you a reader or writer? So if you, if you want to see the books that I write, you click on reader. If you want to see what I do to help authors, you click on writer. That's awesome. Great job. Awesome. Yeah. Good. Thanks for being here. This has been great. Thanks so much for having me. This yeah. is such a nice way to spend a morning. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So thanks for listening, everybody. We'll have all the links at wish I'd known for writers.com and we'll see you next week. Yep. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the wish I'd known then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.